Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified Podcast. My name is Lauren Wells, here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. We're committed to providing you with the knowledge required to build wealth through real estate investing. Tired of consuming content about real estate? Stuck in analysis paralysis? Ready to do your first deal? As a member of our community, you will learn how to go from consuming content to taking that first step into the world of real estate investing. Our show is not about getting rich quick, but about providing you with the knowledge you need to take action. Join us as we speak with experienced investors who share action tips on how to escape the corporate world, start a thriving side hustle in the world of real estate, and go beyond your W-2 or 401k. My name is Lauren Wells, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast, where each week we aim to bring you education and information that will help you take your next step in building wealth through real estate. So this week, we want to talk about what a Regulation A offering is and share some exciting news. So a little kind of background before we get two into what a Regulation A offering is. Um, Chris, since I'm going to be asking you a ton of questions this episode, you know, or maybe that's how it always is anyways. (laughs) Um, So a little background, you know, as someone who is new to the investing world, when you talk about real estate investment funds, what are they? You know, how are they structured? What does that look like? Sure. First, welcome back. So Lauren <laughs> took a little vacation there before a uh, little break bef- uh, before some exciting news will announce. So a lot of people hear the term fund syndication, uh, two terms people use hand in hand. And a fund or syndication is the pooling of money uh, to... Uh, invest in a type of asset or asset class. So many people have heard of multifamily syndication where a sponsor, who's the person who's putting the deal together, goes out, gets a multifamily deal under agreement, and then raises money from you know hundreds of thousands, however many number of investors to invest in that offering. So that's kind of a fund or syndication at a high level. And uh, we can talk about the different types of syndications or funds that most people are familiar with as well. That's a great description of kind of like what funds and syndications are. Most funds though, are what type of funds? So most are what's called a regulation D 506 C. Uh, So one thing I just want to add is a fund is a very passive investment. So you put your money in and uh, just essentially wait. And the 506 The Regulation D 506C is a type of fund that allows the sponsor to be exempt from the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the exemption does have some rules that apply to it. Uh, One of the main rules is in order to invest, the investor has to be an accredited investor, which I'll let you give the definition of an accredited investor. So Chris... (laughs) <laughs> Tell us what an accredited, what qualifies someone as an accredited investor? So the two main categories are a annual income, gross annual income over 200,000 if you're single, 300,000 if you're married, or a net worth outside of your primary residence of a million dollars. Now there's some other caveats to it that if you hold certain uh, licenses like a series 65 as a you know, somebody who can sell securities that puts you in that category. But for most people, it's the single 200,000 or 300,000 if you're married or net worth over a million outside of your primary residence. Correct. So with regulation D offerings, that's, you know, obviously a big barrier to entry for a lot of people. But I would say something else that I've noticed with a lot of those offerings is the, um, another barrier being the minimum investment. Would you agree that most of the time there is a higher minimum investment than is available to people who are looking to just start out with their first investment? No, absolutely. And I was actually reading an article this morning where people were asking, hey, can I go get my Series 65 license so I'm quote unquote accredited? Uh, But then, you know, someone put a really good comment is, 
great, go do that. But you still need $50,000, you know, liquid to invest in these types of offerings because I'd say 50,000, the average, I've seen them go as low as 25. They typically don't go lower than that. And high is, you know, up around 250, 250,000. Yeah. So this really does rule out just one, the fact that you have to be accredited and two, the minimum investment amount is usually, well, let's say at the low end, 25,000, um, mm -hmm. just to get started. So, you know, that a majority of the offerings that we've seen that are funds are regulation D offerings. Now that kind of brings us to what we want to talk about today is, you know, a regulation A plus offering. So how is a regulation A plus offering different from a regulation D offering? Yeah, there's not enough time, I think, to talk about every difference, <laughs> but the the big differences are first, uh, it does have to go through the SEC. It's not exempt. Uh, and you get what is called qualified. So that's the first major difference is, you know, that you have to submit to the SEC and all the information is public record. So everything that gets submitted to the SEC is public. You have to submit, you know, biannual reports, audited financials, uh, everything along those lines is public knowledge. So people can look at that information. By making that information public, they do allow for non-accredited investors to invest as well. So there are other types of regulation D offerings that allow for non-accredited, but it has to be somebody you have an existing relationship with um, and, and there's only a, a minimum amount. But with the regulation A, you can have unlimited amounts of non-accredited investors. So that is one of the major differences from an operating standpoint. Uh, the others are typically you engage a licensed broker dealer. Uh, you have to use special fintech companies to uh, invest the money and have it go through uh, an escrow portal and also need a transfer agent who's the person who uh, basically keeps track of all the shares of stock. A lot of people also call the Regulation A-plus offering a mini IPO uh, because you're essentially buying shares in a company and the sponsor does have the ability actually to go list it on an exchange if they wanted. So here we're going to drop some exciting news. Um, <laughs> what have you done? What have you been working on in this past year? Chris? Mm -hmm. So last year, uh, actually back in September, uh, I had the uh, squirrel idea of, you know, we call it squirrel because I'm always, you know, trying wait, to- Wait, wait, let's stop right there. Let's not take away some credit from you. You say last September, but what you really mean is probably like four years ago, you thought about this. Um, yeah, probably, but really what, um, you know, two major events supercharged this. One was when the uh, Build Back Better, say that five times fast, Bill, yeah, say that five times fast, uh, was talking about the whole Peter Thiel, where you may have heard that person. He took his IRA and, and basically used it for PayPal and made like $5 billion or some insane amount of money off of his IRA tax-free. So in that bill, they were trying to really um, restrict a lot of private investments with IRAs. And one of the ways around that was through a Regulation A plus offering. So that really had me starting to look at the attorney with my attorney, starting to put that process together. And then and, you know, another event happened in like January, February timeframe um, with some staffing. And uh, we basically, you know, put that, you know, kind of on overdrive. Uh, so then in April, we submitted uh, documents to the SEC. And uh, this past July, this month, we uh, got our qualification from the SEC where we can now go raise up to $75 million a year. Um, to uh, within our regulation A plus offering. So in short, in <laughs> you told year, me to go back. No, you told yeah, me to go back. I did. So in short, in the last yeah. year, you, well, pr prior to this, you've run a ton, you've offered a ton of regulation D offerings. So yeah. in the past year, you've really been working on kind of building out your team, the broker dealer, the escrow agent, our marketing team, internal mm -hmm. staff, to support this reggae offering, which like you said, we submitted to the SEC, went through the qualification process, and now are open for business, I guess you could say. Yeah. 
Um, what, you know, you alluded to it a little bit, but I think there is more to why you decided to start this route. You talked about kind of mm -hmm. the build back better bill. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> it's it, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but another thing that we, you know, we had talked about when deciding to go this route was the ability to really open, you've done, like I said, regulation D offerings, you've offered partials, you've done joint ventures over the last, you know, what, five, 10 years. So this kind of is a combination allowing those investors who have partaken in any of those investment journeys with you to kind of all come under this one umbrella of a regulation A plus offering. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they hit the nail on the head. I was tired of my wife screaming at me about all the tax returns we have for all the different funds and entities. And I still hear it. So by taking everything and rolling it into one entity, um, that saves, you know, a little less gray hair on my head. But no, really, it was like you said, we've done a handful of the 506C offerings with accredited investors. We did um, a 506B offering as well, which allowed for non-accredited and accredited. And then, like you said, we we're also doing the partials. And, you know, for people who have rentals and be like, oh, I'll have an LLC for every rental. Uh, the more LLCs you have, you know, more companies, the more headaches you have. And I view this as also a way to simplify things, but also get everybody involved because like you said, there's a lot of investors out there who have requested or looked to wanted to invest in the past, but really had certain hurdles that they couldn't overcome. So by now doing this regulation A plus offering, uh, we can open that up now to uh, everybody. Yeah. So some other points on that is, you know, it is it being open to everyone different from a regulation D offering. So you don't have to be a, an accredited investor. You know, you don't have the barrier to entry, the investment minimum, which we'll talk about in a bit, is a lot lower. It's, you know, it's something that any investor who's looking to, whether they're, I say every season of investor, whether they've, you know, invested in a ton of different funds or syndications, or they're looking to just invest in a fund for the first time and start kind of generating some passive income, whether it's with, you know, cash or their retirement account. Um, this kind of allows for all of that. Mm -hmm. So what would you say were some surprises when we went through the qualification process? You know, why do you think the qualification process is the way it is? Well, it's a lengthy process. There's a lot of people. It's under a lot of scrutiny as well, which it should be because you're allowed to go out and solicit to the public um, funds from them to, them to invest in. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of requirements. There's a lot of information you have to provide to people. It's the form called a 1A, which outlines all the terms, but also all the risks along with investing, uh, which in a 506C offering, again, we'll just go back comparison. Most people put together what's called a private placement memorandum or PPM, but technically you don't even need to provide that because you're dealing with accredited investors. Uh, when you start dealing with non-accredited investors, uh, the types of information that is required is significant and substantial. Um, so that's one area. The other is the number of team players. Uh, some people on 506Cs will get broker dealers and some other, these companies involved, but let's say 99% of them don't. But in a Regulation A offering, you definitely need to put together, um, you know, an all-star team to, you know, handle every single aspect of it because everything has to follow certain processes and procedures to make sure the trail from the beginning of the investor journey to the end follows that specific path. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I get that question a lot. Like, how is it different when I'm speaking with potential investors? And I think you kind of, hit the nail on the head when you were talking about how, you know, it is very scrutinized because you are allowed to go out and market to the general public and raise capital mm -hmm. where, so in a sense, I view it as a safeguard for mm -hmm. investors, you know, who are looking to invest for the first time. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's a safeguard, 
but it's a safeguard based off of what they're offering. It's still up to that investor to understand who they're offering with. Now they've had to do background checks on you or I to make sure that we haven't been involved in all these Ponzi schemes or whatever it may be, but they don't check to say, oh, Chris 70, you've been in real estate 25 years, check. Um, that's not the level of detail. That's the level of detail you as the investor should have to go be going through. I sense another nice. podcast episode coming up about that. Okay. So let's talk about what the D de- like the details of your regulation A offering. So what our, our regulation A <laughs> So let's start with what are you investing in? What are we investing in? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so our primary investment is in first position performing and non-performing mortgage notes. So for those who invested with us in the past or have seen us or listened to our prior podcast, the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast, uh, that was our primary focus was on uh, mortgage notes. Uh, so that is what the majority of the offering will uh, entail is those first position uh, performing and non-performing loans. And at a high level for people who are new to the podcast or aren't as, you know, seasoned with what mortgage notes are, can you give a description of what they are? Can you explain a little bit about them? Sure. Uh, so notice how you, I said high level. Yeah, I know. Uh, high level is if you've ever bought a property and gotten a loan from a bank, uh, you get two documents, a note, which is a IOU, and then a mortgage, which attaches that note to the property. So if you stop paying on the note, then the mortgage allows the bank to use the house's collateral. Uh, the banks basically usually take those, securitize them into portfolios. And when they get distressed or borrowers stop paying, they will get sold off and they work their way down from... Uh, institutions down to Wall Street, down to uh, other funds, down to the individual Main Street investor. So that in a high level is what a mortgage note is. And a non-performing one is one where the borrower is uh, typically more than 90 days past due. So how does the fund make money then? I would feel like if I was a new investor, that would probably be, you know, how, how am I as an investor, if I give you my money, how am I going to get paid? You know, what does that process look like? And, mm-hmm. you know, something we talk about a lot at 70 mm-hmm. investments is, you know, mm-hmm. our process is a little bit mm-hmm. different. You know, we have that mm-hmm. full type dim- three-dimensional picture of the notes. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that so that, you know, mm-hmm. people understand, I, I mm-hmm. guess, where their money is going and how yeah. that what that process looks like. Yeah. So first I do have to use the typical caveat that every investment has a risk and no return is guaranteed. So yeah, that's a question people, first question people always ask me is somebody's not paying their mortgage. How do you make money on that? And the answer to that is you get to buy it at a discount. So think of, you know, if you're buying a car that's been, you know, in a car accident or damaged, you know, you buy that at a discount, try and repair it and, you know, either keep it or resell it. On a mortgage, in a note, it's very similar. You're buying the loan with the borrower not paying, but you're buying it at a discount. And by buying it at a discount, it gives you more flexibility to work with the borrower on new payment terms. So what is the philosophy at 70 when kind of working out those notes and working with borrowers? Yeah, we always want to keep the borrower in their homes. You know, that's our number, that's what we attempt to do. Does it happen on every occasion? Unfortunately, it doesn't. But our primary focus is to work with the borrowers to get them on a payment plan that is reasonable and affordable and uh, continue to keep them in their house to give them what's called like a trial payment plan of, you know, try and make payments for six months. And then if they do that, you know, modify the loan to um, some new terms. Okay. Uh, Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, a lot of times, like everybody else, people have something that happens that goes on in their life and they get caught behind. And a lot of the institutions will only allow a borrower to make all the payments that catch up. So if you're six months behind, they'll be like, nope, you got to pay all six months. And 
you know, it's basically that snowball starts spinning downhill because they can't. And every month they're missing another payment because the bank won't accept their payments. And in many instances with us, you know, we look to take a down payment that might not be that full amount to try and work with them. Yeah. And this is a question, like a question I get a lot is really when people are looking to invest in something, it's easy to understand, oh, I'm going to invest in like a rental property with like a fund that does multifamily or a fund that does, you know, single family rentals. But that's why I think it's so important to talk about what notes are, mm -hmm. how, what our process looks like and really how it's a little bit different from other funds who invest in this space, perhaps. Um, One thing I just want to jump in and say is like you talk, people hear about multifamily, the biggest difference between notes and multifamily is multifamily, it's typical one asset. So you are banking on that one asset in that fund that will either make it or break it. And in today's environment with interest rate increases and cap rates increasing, you know, what their exit strategy was three years ago might not be accurate and they have no room to, you know, there's not much they can do because it's that one asset. In a note fund, you're constantly buying and selling notes and you have a very large portfolio. So as that portfolio continues to grow, uh, it's very dynamic where it's very easy to make shifts in the portfolio balance, similar to people who have, you know, a large stock portfolio with 20 different stocks, you can shift um, levels of risk uh, much more in a much simplified manner than you could if it's just one multifamily deal you're investing in. Oh, I have so many questions off of that. <laughs> so <laughs> let's start with you know, you kind of talked about how it's different from multifamily, but I want to, maybe this isn't a question, it's a comment. You know, a lot of people will come and ask me the same thing, like, oh, but I was also looking at XYZ company where you can invest in like one note, or I was looking at partials. And I think what you said is the same. It's kind of spreading the risk among multiple assets versus really putting all your eggs in one basket with mm -hmm. a single asset. Um, I, the question I had was, you know, how do interest rates and rising in the state of the market today affect the notes industry or our business specifically? There's not as much correlation as people think. Uh, and the reason why is, and again, people look on the news, see all these mortgage lenders who are laying people off. Uh, the biggest correlating factor in mortgage notes is employment. You know, if mortgage rate for most people, like you or I, we both own homes. You know, we have fixed mortgages on our homes. Interest rates go up. Okay, interest rates go up. We're probably not going to be selling our house anytime soon uh, because of the high interest rates. Um, so the biggest core, you know, so it's really not the interest rates. It's some of the ancillary things that happen with interest rates uh, that could have an effect, such as if home prices start to come down because that has an impact potentially on note buying because you wanna have equity in your note or if you don't have equity, you base it off of a, the property value and if that value is going down, it could devalue your note. So employment and property values are really kind of the two biggest factors that I view as having the biggest impact on um, the notes. Yeah, I'd have to agree on that, especially specifically employment, you know, with a people being laid off. And like you said, if you have a fixed income or if you have a fixed mm -hmm. mortgage and mm -hmm. you lose your job, that's not a super great mm -hmm. position to be in, you know, yeah. cost of goods going up also, mm -hmm. I think has an impact all the things that will raise someone's spending. Yeah. And I mean, you can Google it, but there's stats that say like 60 to 65% of people live paycheck to paycheck. So any type of blip on the map for them, can be very detrimental, whether it's a loss of job, loss of loved one, um, reduction in hours, reduction in pay, inflation. So not as much interest rates, but inflation costing everything else to go up uh, may have an impact on them being able to afford their home. So who, I know we kind of talked how this fund is open to everyone accredited, non-accredited, mm -hmm. but you know, Describe who you feel like would this investment, this fund would be an ideal investment for. All 7 billion people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I can whittle that down if you want. Yes, that'd How be much, great. Well, there's several different categories of people. Uh, I think one area that I think this is perfect for 
is the individuals who have an IRA, uh, you know, individual retirement account that allows you to put $6,000 per year in, and they may have built it to buy some real estate, or they may even own real estate, but they may have five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 sitting around in their IRA. They don't want to put it in the markets because the markets are very volatile right now. And they're looking for um, the potential for some passive uh, monthly distributions of income. So that would be a you know, perfect example or a perfect opportunity for somebody to invest. And again, you know, uh, get the potential for those types of returns. So that's one area. Other types of real estate investors, uh, you know, invest uh, in these types of funds to diversify. And then honestly, just, you know, that's why I joked like the 7 billion people, because anybody who has 500 or $1,000, you know, $500 minimum to invest and, you know, you know, diversify across a portfolio. If you look at the correlation of real estate to all other asset classes, you know, it's there's really nothing that has a strong correlation or negative correlation to real estate. And then when you look at mortgage notes, it's even less correlation because of the nuances of it. And I'm pulling some questions that I know we were we've been asked in the past week or so. You know, how is this different from a REIT? Can you go a little bit into that? Because I this is probably yeah. one of the top questions that comes up with, you know, mm -hmm. people that I speak with. So if I, if I start twitching, I apologize because I did spend a weekend researching uh, REITs, and originally the first intent was we were going to do a Regulation A plus offering as a REIT, um, which is a real estate investment trust where investors invest into that trust, uh, but it's a very passive investment is what a REIT is. And even the sponsor has to be very passive and all their other entities, like they may have a management company and all these other things, they're actually done out of separate entities. Uh, now the taxation is very different in a REIT on how that works. Um, I'm not gonna get into how REITs are taxed because you get essentially like a 20% deduction off of what you get for interest and then the rest of it's taxed to ordinary income. Uh, but if the REIT gives out 90% of its profits that year, and again, sorry, I'm going down that rabbit hole. Um, but with okay, non wait, did you just say you weren't going to go down this rabbit hole? I did, then I did. So, uh, but like I mentioned, with a REIT, it has to be passive and non-performing notes is not considered passive on a sponsorship level. So that's why uh, the REIT was not the right type of fit for this type of investment. Or so, this type of structure, I should say, not investment. So how did we decide to structure our mm -hmm. offering? After how many Excel data tables of analyzing an LLC, a C corporation, and a REIT, uh, we made the determination to structure the entity as a C corporation uh, versus any an LLC or S corp, uh, which to us, we, we felt that provided the best strategy not only for the fund, but absolutely for the investors. Yeah. And without getting into or giving tax advice, as you know, anyone listening, you should definitely consult your own CPA. But mm -hmm. at a high level, what is the C Corp? How is that advantageous from a tax perspective mm -hmm. for investors? Mm -hmm. So when people hear C Corp, they think, oh my God, double taxation. And so people a lot of times get scared or run away. Uh, but there's also many benefits to as an investor in a C corporation. Uh, the two that I'll discuss are one it, for IRA investors. Again, check with your plan sponsor and make sure you understand. But the research we've done shows that a IRA investor does not have to worry about, I guess, uh, the UDFI slash UBIT taxes because of the structure of a C-Corp. And if you don't know what that is, ask your custodian. But that's one of the biggest complaints we hear from people is, hey, yeah. I invested in this fund. They went and they borrowed $100 million out of $200 million fund. And now a percentage of my uh, distributions are being taxed. Yeah, I'd say it's probably with people investing with their self-directed 401k or IRA, it's probably the top question I get is, mm -hmm. Am I going to be subject to UBIT slash UDF? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then from, you know, say I have, you know, cash funds I'd like to invest. You know, what, mm -hmm. 
how does that help me that it's a C corp or does it help me? Yep. So no, it have again, talk to your tax advisor. Um, but C corporations. I know the answer to these. I just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so with C corporations, you're actually buying shares of a company. Um, think of Apple, Microsoft, you know, they're C corporations that you buy shares of. It's the same with this entity, you'd be buying a shares. And if they're held for a specific period of time, they should uh, be considered a qualified dividend, uh, which the next question is, okay, what is a qualified dividend? And qualified dividends, uh, one is you don't have to worry about the dreaded K-1. Uh, if you don't know what a K-1 is, or you've never gotten one, God bless you, um, because they are a tax form that you get. There's nothing complex with the form, but they takes a while for the CPAs to create and get those out the door, even though they're supposed to be out in February. Uh, I'm still waiting on one for one of the investments I did in a syndication. Uh, so that's the first. And the second is uh, qualified dividends are taxed at a much lower rate than um, ordinary income, or if you're investing a syndication, that's an LLC that gives you a K-1. I believe it starts at 0% if your salary, I think, or income is less than 40. It's got like a 0, a 15, and a 20% bracket. But it, in most instances, it's a good 10% delta, um, meaning that if you're in like the 20% dividend bracket, you're tax rate is usually like 32 to 37%. So yeah, so the qualified dividend tax rates are 0, 15, and 20, whereas the income tax rates can go all the way up to 37. Yeah. So mm -hmm. instead of receiving mm -hmm. a K-1, you receive a 1099 mm -hmm. div form and the tax mm -hmm. ramifications are different. So mm -hmm. I think when we're you know going through this and setting it up, it was really about making it as simple for investors as possible. So when they see, oh, this isn't the return there, the preferred return, this is, you know, this is what I can expect versus, okay, they're promising this return, but then I also have to take into account the taxes I'm going to pay on the back end. So they're not, there will be taxes. There is always taxes. <laughs> Eventually you pay. Yeah. yeah. But we really tried to make it as, you know, straightforward and simple as possible for investors um, and really tax friendly. And I, I put know. together a really cool spreadsheet that I get really excited talking to people about. So feel free to reach out. And uh, I like to geek out about that stuff. You can reach Matt Chris at 70. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it was like investor relations at 70 investments.com. Isn't that the. <laughs> so, well, we've covered a lot. We've covered what a regulation A offering, how it differentiates, our specific offering, what we invest in, um, some of the tax benefits. However, we haven't talked about what our offering is. So <laughs> do you want to talk about the details of the offering as far as investment amount, lockup period, bonus shares, all those things? No, I want <laughs> you to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead and do that. I'm going to make you talk a little bit instead of asking the questions. I'll let you answer some of the questions today. So we have a Regulation A offering, it is open to, like we mentioned earlier, accredited, non-accredited investors investing with retirement funds or cash. The kind of, I could say, details behind it is we are looking to give a 8% preferred return annual, which is paid monthly. So if an investor was to invest today, their interest on that investment would start accruing August 1st, and their first dividend check would be sent on September 1st. Yep. So, so just caveat is we're recording this in mid July. So <laughs> if this launches in August, uh, it's the first day of the go. following month is it starts accruing and it gets paid the, fir the first business day of the that Correct. next month. So I'll give another example. If you invest <laughs> September 3rd, interest will start accruing October 1st, you'll get paid your first dividend check November 1st. So, um, I always feel like it's good to give examples like that. Um, so dividends are paid monthly and there is a lockup period of four years, meaning that should you choose to pull your investment, um, there are penalties to doing so. 
Um, so four years, it's kind of like this. A lot of people like to think of it as a set it and forget it. So, oh, the big one. I don't know how I missed this one. The minimum investment. <laughs> so we talked earlier about the minimum investment for most other offerings that only accept money from qualified investors is usually 25, 50, you know, hundred plus thousand dollars. So for our offering, the minimum investment is $500. And yes, I am not making an error. The minimum investment is $500. Again, because we do want to make this open and accessible to people who, you know, kind of want to dip their toe in and start investing in a passive, an investment that pays monthly dividends. So I'm trying to think, Chris, we do, oh, bonus shares. Yes. So I know. So, you know, our goal is 8% paid monthly, 8% annual paid monthly. And however, there is the option to get bonus shares. So we do have a limited number of limited number of bonus shares that we are offering. And that really just depends on the investment amount. So the more you invest, the higher your annual percentage goes up. And mm -hmm. I am more than happy to kind of walk through that. I don't want to kind of put the numbers out there. It's hard to really visualize um, without seeing the table. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is I'll include in the show notes our offering page that kind of talks a little bit more about, you know, mm -hmm. what our offering is, who we are, you know, how we, you know, get investors their money. And that site is invest.70investments.com. And again, I will put that in the show notes or rather have Tony, our new marketing manager, do that. <laughs> so what else, Chris? Is there anything else I missed? Now, can you explain to people what bonus shares are? You know, what are they? Like, what, what's the bonus? Not, not the amount, but is it something that they get to buy them at a discount or is it a reduced price or, you know, what are bonus shares? Good question. So bonus shares, essentially, so the minimum investment for us to get bonus shares is 25,000. So what does that mean? So 25,000, your return, your annual return is going to go to 9%. Projected. Projected. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not making any guarantees. Your preferred return. <laughs> yes. So it's $10 per share with the minimum, as we mentioned, 500. But if you bought 2,500 shares, spent 25,000, we will give you for free a hundred shares. So you don't get 2,500, you get 2,600. And which of course, the, yeah, which in turn, those shares are also earning that um, dividend. And then when you liquidate or, you know, want to redeem your shares after, you know, four years or whatever point in time, uh, then you will also get the, you know, the, those shares redeemed as well. So that price would come, you know, if it's $10 per share, you'd get the extra, you know, hundred shares, thousand dollars back as well. Well, there you go. So Good explanation. So, free shares. There we go. Yeah. I mean, free shares, um, yeah. which, increase, which increase your annual return. Yeah. I believe it's nine point, it's a little over nine. I think it's like 908 or 916, but yes. rejected. I'm a numbers guy. She, Lauren's like, now, like, if anyone was watching the video, she's grinding her teeth right now. And if she could jump through the screen and strangle me, she would. No, no. Just, we explain things very differently. It's good. It's good. Um, so you might, you gave the website. Uh, what about if somebody also just wanted to reach out via email? Uh, what is the best email address to reach yes. out? Great question. So, I mean, I've given out my email address on probably the last three episodes. So you can email me directly. However, we do have a specific um, inbox for this. So that's invest at 70investments.com. Seven, the number, not spelled out. So invest at 7einvestments.com. If you're interested, you have questions. Um, on our offering page, there is also a link to a webinar we did, which kind of walks through more details of what we talked about today on this episode. So the only other thing I'll add is on that page next to the invest button, uh, right below it is a link to the SEC's website for the circular, uh, which provides all the information that we had to provide to them, including 
uh, all the terms, conditions, key contracts, key personnel, all that fun stuff. It reminds me one thing we didn't talk about. And, you know, we are very transparent. I think that's one of the pillars we stand on. So a- another question that I don't know how I didn't bring this up earlier. What are the risks? And this came up because <laughs> if you are someone who re- wants to read every single risk that could possibly take place, you should mm-hmm. read the offering circular because it literally covers everything. Um, so Chris, what are some of the risks? Like, what am I as a newer investor? What am I, what should I be worried about? What are some things I should be thinking about or ask when I'm looking at to invest in, I guess you could say any fund, you know, what are some things I should be asking? Well, I'll give a little prelude because this would be a great topic for another uh, podcast episode. Uh, but with any investment, you know, there's significant risk, uh, Several that roll off the tongue are who's the team, who's the sponsor, what experience they have. So there's the corporate side of things of looking at that, the company and who those people are and understanding kind of like key man policies. If something happens to somebody, you know, do they have systems or in place? You know, a lot of the regulation D 506 C's is run by like one person. So that one person's running it. And if they, you know, Unfortunately, something were to happen to them where, you know, they couldn't continue to manage or operate what happens. Um, So that's always an important thing on the corporate side, on the actual investment where the investing side, again, you want to understand what that investment is Uh, Tip, you know, get some type of knowledge on what it is you're investing whether it's, um, you know, multifamily building notes like this, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, invest in crypto, but don't even know what crypto is or have a lot of understanding for it. Um, so you definitely want to make sure you understand what you're investing in. Um, and, you know, kind of ask those questions. Okay. Like you asked today, if the market, you know, there's a lot of headwinds in the markets right now. If the stock market goes down, could that affect my investment? If real estate goes up or down, how does that affect my investment? Uh, so uh, is government regulation, you know, states now, certain states are um, borrower friendly, certain ones are lender friendly. Um, if more rules come into place in government, how does that affect my investment? Uh, and again, this is just five, we could name 500. Yeah, I definitely so, think we should do an episode on this, you know, questions yeah. to ask interviewing your sponsor. Oh, um, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on this episode of the CWS podcast. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, subscribe, or leave us a review. Till next time, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining Lauren and I on this episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Each week, we bring you expert education, experience, and information in a digestible format to help you identify investment opportunities so you can build wealth through real estate and take action toward your financial goals. Enjoy the show, share with a friend, or subscribe to the show, and leave us a review. 